Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Between the Sharks. In this box, we have some brand new parts we've been waiting on for our 1927 Ford Touring Hot Rod Project. Now the parts in this box, they're not really subject to debate. However, the installation process and the correct setup of these parts is the subject of great debate. And now that may not be uncommon for people to like argue with each other on the internet about how to do something. In the case of these parts, the end result of that argument is literally, there's no substantive information on either side of how to do it correctly. That doesn't really tell me anything. So we're gonna use our brain pans. We can do this. It's gonna, oh God, the stupid internet. Now, if you're the reading type, you probably know from the description just what we're dealing with today. There we go. Rear radius rods, AKA hairpins. I guess Speedway sends them with this little spreader bar that a guy's got to weld in. I feel qualified for that. I'm gonna have to screw up this uh, fancy pants paint job. The subject of a lot of debate, how to set up rear hairpins. So we've got two things that we've really got to cover in this video, which is, man, we have a lot more than that. So in this video, we've got to cover, A, how to get these things even like ready to go and dialed in because when you get them in the mail, you got to weld this thing in you got to put all the ends in, get everything kind of ready to go in the car. Plus, you got to choose the mounting brackets for your rear end. And then we've also got to cover, like, how they go in. What's the angle? What's the deal? Been doing a lot of blah, blah, blahing about suspension, and we're going to just keep that up because the Internet is full of incorrect, mostly uninformed, you know, information. Uninformed information. This doesn't really look like much yet. So before we can even discuss how it's supposed to work, we gotta start assembling this thing. Uh, quick note, if you purchase these from Speedway, it does not come with these ends. So you need to buy all of this separately. So let's go ahead and assemble it quickly. Right here is everything you need to assemble this whole setup. Two clevis joints, one heim joint, three jam nuts, and some anti-seize. Uh, it's a pretty simple process. You want to put some anti-seize on the threads. Here's how I like to do it. I like to thread the jam nut. Oh no. Minor hiccup. Grab the wrong satchula jam nuts, you see? So anyway, we're back in business. Anti-seize on the threads, right? And the way I like to do it is to thread the jam nut on fuzz over halfway. And the fuzz over halfway is because this is in theory to be adjustable. However, you literally, you can't be fully adjustable. You need some threads always in the whoop de doo So I kind of do it like that. It leaves me about a half inch this way. In theory, if I went about a half inch out, which would be a lot, it would still leave me with a half inch of threads. All right, sports fans, not off to a killer start here. So what I ordered are the wrong doohickeys. These heim joints are unfortunately, as stated on the package, left-hand thread. which is the backwards ones. We're gonna move on and we're gonna have to use a little imagination. Um, we're gonna order the new parts that we need, but let's go ahead and get these uh, clevis ends in. All right, this isn't a big deal, but it is important. So the idea is to get it threaded. What I do is actually count the turns and I'm trying to get to my jam nut, counting the turns, and I'm going to mimic that with this one up here. And I'm gonna do that on the other hairpin that we still have to set up. That way, my distance from these ends down to the front of this thing is gonna be the same on not only the top and the bottom, but also both units. So if this is your first go at this, I usually put a screwdriver through here and give them a spin. Now, you will find that with these things being freshly cut, like this is drawn over mandrel tubing that they've threaded on the inside, it can get a little tight. So what I tend to do is work it ultimately back and forth so that there's minimal minimal resistance because you don't want to just keep going and pushing whatever you're pushing through. Now that we've got these guys in place, we need to weld in our stiffener. The important part right now is that this distance stays correct. In theory, I could weld this too far in and spread our hairpins out. I could weld it too far back and pull them together. What I'm going to do is Leave this like this, slide it till it fits, 
We'll grind everything down and we'll weld it up because we're already here at our welding table. It's time to go ahead and open a new beverage because this is gonna be sort of, we gotta, we gotta dive into what all these things are supposed to do and how they're supposed to do it before we can figure out how we're gonna actually apply that to our 27 Ford. These do three things for you. Two of the three are very similar to what's going on on the front end with the wishbones or hairpins that you used up there. The first of those is they locate the axle square to the frame. That is basically achieved by getting your brackets equidistant, you know, basically from the outside of your axle and then getting your front mounting point wherever you put it being the same distance on both sides, thus making your axle perpendicular to your frame and keeping your back wheels straight going down the road. Just to drive home the point, we've gone over this in our wishbone video, but basically our mounting point from our axle back to the mounting point of the heim joint is equal on both sides, thus squaring up the front axle. We need to come up with a similar predicament back here. Brief addendum to step one. It does locate your axle to keep it square. It's also gonna locate the pinion up and down to set your pinion angle and like keep it in place. But just small note, we'll get to that. Number two, we're gonna skip over because that is the real doozy. That is allowing for the suspension travel, which is very much like the wishbones. And we are going to dive into that in just a second. But we're gonna go ahead and skip to three because that's really easy to digest. Number three. Prime example, right? I'm gonna rotate this wheel, but watch how everything moves. I spin the wheel backwards. The pinion's actually rotating up. The yoke is actually moving. This is Newtonian physics at work. So there we go. Uh, the basic idea is an object in motion will stay in motion unless, he, you know, unless it's acted on by an equal or opposite force and an object at rest will stay at rest unless acted upon. You have got to keep this from rotating in order to make that rotate. Once this bracket is welded onto our housing wherever we want it, and the front of this thing is mounted via heim joint to a fixed point on our frame, if the axle tries to rotate either up or down during acceleration or braking or going in reverse or any of those things, if it tries to rotate down, it's going to apply the force down this rod to our fixed point. This is going to resist that motion. Plus this bottom piece will actually be an extension, which is extremely strong, meaning it's gonna to have to try to pull that bottom rod backwards to rotate the axle. Thus, keeping our axle at the right angle anytime load is applied forcing the axle to try to twist or turn because of the power coming down the drive shaft trying to turn the wheels until the point of least resistance is the wheels and the wheels are going to move and you are going to boogie that way i think it's time to investigate and deep dive into number two all right so we're back at the front of the car again because people seem to get the idea of split wishbones they they accept that it works, but they don't really understand it. So hopefully our last video clarified that, but stock wishbones were joined at a center point with a ball pivot, allowing everything to rotate from a center point. As soon as you split the wishbones and move them out to the edge of the frame, the further out you get, the worse it gets. Meaning as one wheel goes up or down, you're kind of forcing a twist in a little bit of everything. That's why you have a heim joint, there's probably a little twist in the wishbone and there's probably a little twist in the axle. Now, that said, it seems to be an accepted fact that these I-beam axles can indeed take that twist just a little bit and flex just enough to allow the system to work. There is an issue with tube axles up front and that issue translates to the back, meaning tube doesn't twist, which is what we have in the back. So we gotta deal with that. So now, We've got to understand the misconceptions to understand what we're going to try to do here. For example, I have just put these things in parallel to each other because a couple of things contribute to this idea. The first is that the brackets that they sell only fit this way. You actually have to grind them down to get them to turn any other which way. 
The other thing is that most of the writing on rear suspension setups, hairpins, ladder bars, or whatever, are really smart articles based on drag racing. The problem is we're not building a drag car. We're building a street car. And there's one spectacularly huge difference. So in a drag car, the idea is to keep both wheels on the ground, firmly planted, driving the car straight forward, right? On our street car, we need the wheels to be able to lift independently of each other, right? We need to be able to turn into a burger stand, hit the curb kind of, you know, a little bump that goes onto the burger stand parking lot, if you will. And one wheel is going to hit it first, so the whole axle is going to have to rotate this way. We can see here with our mock-up, just eyeballing it. Granted, we will have a heim joint at the end, but there's our rotation. Your pivot point is going to be the center of your axle, meaning the further out you go, you're also working on an arc kind of going this way. If you have a fixed point in the front and you are totally perpendicular to your axle, as your axle tries to rotate, well, it's not going to twist your axle tube, that's for sure. This whole bracket is welded. These are fixed points, meaning you are going to go as far as this will go, and then you are going to start bending something else. So you're either going to start twisting your radius rods, or you're going to be applying force to this weld, or all of the above all at once, because this thing wants to keep everything in a straight line. In a racing setup, the binding that happens by them being parallel is actually an advantage because it forces the axle to move as a unit up and down together, mostly forcing the car down. So for traction, it's better and drag strips are generally flat-ish. But for your street car, that binding is kind of bad news. Will it work and put you in a ditch like everybody says? No. And you know how I know? Because there's a bajillion hot rods that have been on the road with hairpins or stock radius rods or whatever brought to the outside of the frame that have driven miles and miles and miles and miles and I'm sure that the forces are working on things trying to break them and slowly making them more brittle and working away at the welds but it's not going to implode right but we can do better than that simply rotating these things towards center which is really the center line of our pivot point where our wheels will rotate eliminates some of the binding let's just say reduces it now there's a misconception in here too so now's a good time to talk about why we're in this mess anyway and the reason we're in this mess is we're using a transverse rear spring a spring that goes side to side and an open drive shaft we are eliminating the torque tube which was designed to deal with this problem and we're doing that because well we're using a different transmission and a different gear ratio rear end and we're looking for a stronger rear end and all the reasons that this has to be eliminated but we're still using the spring setup because that's what the frame likes right if you have leaf springs this isn't an issue right unless you're in a race application you want ladder bars and all that stuff to help spring load but we're not even going to get into that stuff but what i'm saying is this is a problem created because we're eliminating this so here's where the misconception comes in right so People suggest you should mimic what these radius rods are doing, going far out on the axle, meeting as close as possible to a center point. And they should, but that's not what these things are doing. And so I guess it's fine to come to the right conclusion the wrong way, but let's just talk about what the whole system is. So the thing about the way these work and why they're called a torque tube is the drive shaft actually runs through the center of that and spins on the inside. The outer tube is really to handle the torque, meaning it's got a single pivot point where it meets the transmission. It's a solid tube bolted to the rear axle, and that is what resists the axle spinning when you apply the gas. Basically, it has this huge lever to counteract all of our Newtonian physics that we were talking about. So this one thing allows the up and down travel and the rotational travel for the rear end for the back wheels to go up over a bump one at a time. These guys have nothing to do with that. These guys are adding reinforcement back to the torque tube so that as one wheel grabs and the other doesn't, the axle stays square. That's all they're really doing. 
So what I'm getting at is this is not, nor was it ever, a pivot point. All of the pivot points are up there. Now, we're going to borrow from some of this geometry, but that's a misconception big time. Short version of that is stock Ford rear radius rods don't have a pivot point. They are fixed to the torque tube. The torque tube has the pivot point all the way up at the front. We need a pivot point back here. I myself have run 36 Ford rear radius rods as something to handle the torque of the rear end on an open drive and put mounts on them to create a pivot out of them. It's just not what they're designed to do. You can make them do that, but they're not built to do that. That's what the torque tube is for. All right, gang, so let's apply all of these general ideas. Now there's one other thing that we've got to just accept and understand, and that is that this is the center of our rotational universe. It is, as the drive shaft turns, it is where this is going to want to rotate this way, but also as one wheel hooks up, it's going to try to run forward with this as the center of this circle. This is the center point of our axle going like this as we hit bumps. So this is the center of the universe. All right, let's take all that razzmatazz and apply it to two simple rules of thumb. And we'll see how close we can get. Number one, the further out we can get our mounts, the more leverage we are gonna have to help hold that axle tube where we want it in this orientation, right? Because as one wheel grabs, it's gonna try to push forward. The further out we go, the more lever we got. That's all, that's simple. Number two, the closer that our front pivot points are to the center of this rotation, the better off we're going to be and the less we're going to bind. So there you go. We've got a mock-up of the internet's favorite theory. Set them as wide apart as you can and get the fronts as close together as possible. Well, in theory, if these kind of pivoted off a single point, we would be creating what was stock on the front of an early Ford with the wishbone with the ball mount, and it would all just pivot together, or vice versa on the rear end, the coupling on the front of the torque tube that ran under these things functioned like this, meaning the whole unit was together and it pivoted off of a ball at the top of the torque tube. In practical application of radius rods, it's pretty easy to see the extreme situation that we've created here, right? Fine, maybe let's say we created a single ball joint here and it worked for the movement of the axle in this plane. In doing that, in a system like this, we're completely, completely forgetting another fundamental of suspension geometry that we covered in our cartoon episode where we drew everything out. Let's go back and, and talk about that really quick and then come back and look at this again. Remember the side view? This is a tire, right? This is earth, this is ground. And in order for this to travel, our axle has to go up and down, and it is going to swing on an arc relative to this pivot point. The longer this distance, the less dramatic this arc is in movement doesn't really matter what the angle is up here, whether it's, you know, parallel or straight out. The further you are from this point to your axle, the less you're going to force your axle front and back because your overall circle is larger and you're using less of a percentage of it. But so then we go back into the idea that if you have stock radius rods that you're using from an early forward, or you're buying stuff from Speedway like I did, and we're going to use 32 inch rear radius rods, this is very short. This would force this axle to move a lot forward and back. Sure, it may help it this way, but in our general, if our axle's going over a speed bump, we're gonna get a ton of binding movement this way. So we've got to find a happy medium. In theory, for axle travel as a whole, we want this center point to be as far forward as we can make it. And for one wheel at a time, we want them to be as close to center as possible. If you're building your own radius rods or your own ladder bars, you can sort of 
adjust that happy medium more and more and more. For me, I'm working with something that's gonna be about 36 inches overall on a relatively short wheelbase car, but that means I am gonna compromise. This is not what I'm going for because that's only good in one direction. I need it to be good in two directions. All right, I feel reasonably confident in the compromises I'm going to make, but let me show you how we got there. So first things first, I am gonna use this style of bracket that goes over and under the axle. Why? A, because I have it. I need this bracket inboard enough that I have spring travel. So I might be able to get it out here. I can't come all the way to the end of the axle because my frame is right here. And to have this thing travel right under the frame, well, it's going to crash into it anytime I have suspension movement. So it's gotta be inboard and then it needs to be inboard enough that I don't hit the spring every time the spring, you know, does its spring thing. That's part one. Part two, I do want to lean them in towards center to help the other movement, but I also want to get as much length as possible. Basically, I don't want my tire doing too much of this. My general plan is to basically point it at the back of the transmission. So before I pull this axle out to do all this work, I'm going to measure generally from the axle tube to the back of the transmission, invent myself a little triangle, and then I'm gonna line these things up as far out as I can on the axle based on everything we just looked at with the springs and all of that stuff, and then point them towards center at that point. Is it perfect? I have no idea, but it's a compromise. In a perfect, perfect world, they would pivot off a single point, kind of like a torque tube did but we can't do that. It's hot rodding. We're compromising. <sighs> Dudes, this has taken me uh, the better part of the Steelers game today, which is like three hours. Good game though. Insane, ridiculous game. Anyway, I'm going to go through all of this because we got to, there's a lot to cover. There's a lot I'm trying to do with this to make it right. Now, granted, you can set all this stuff up in the car if you choose to, but we're gonna go through step-by-step step what I've got going on here, and then maybe you can apply that to your particular need or your particular car. So, first things first. Generally speaking, I'm deciding on the width of my brackets, meaning the outside edge of my radius rods is based on a couple of things. Number one, it has to be inside of the spring because I do not want this crossing where the frame is. And the frame is a little over three feet wide at the back end. So I've gotta be inside of that. In order to be inside of three, these are actually right at three feet. So that's where that puts us. Now, if you have the brackets that drop down below the axle, it's not as much of an issue. I have those on the Mercury. Like I said, check out the Mercury video if you wanna see that stuff. But these are gonna work for me just fine. So if you're looking down at this, I decided to pretend that they were gonna intersect right around four feet out from my axle tube, which is roughly where the back of the transmission's gonna be, roughly. Now I'm basing that to pretend that these are longer to keep the axle this angle of rotation. So like as the axle bounces up and down, straight up and down, to keep the push and pull of this radius, you know, further, put that radius further out. I think that I still have more than enough of this angle to keep it from binding, as opposed to if they were parallel. I'm deciding that my best bet is to keep the center of my hairpins even with the center of my axle tube. That way, at neutral, in theory, I am at the center of my travel for up and down a tube. In fact, if you've got a kick up or a Z, I'm saying it again, you probably want the brackets that hang below your axle. So now that we've got it lined up and it's pointing at our center point, I'm going to pull it here. I will explain this whole contraption in a second. That leaves me roughly a foot between the front of my radius rods, which is more than enough for my drive shaft to cruise on through. That's got to happen. Must be simple. 
my choice to pull the rear end out was based on a lot of things. Uh, measuring with the car body on was going to be a huge problem. Um, these measurements are kind of a big deal. They don't have to be any specific number, but you do need symmetrical. And if you have watched this channel for any amount of time, finding reference points and pulling diagonals and symmetry and all of that stuff, I go through that in every video. We'll go through how I did it here. But to me, this was a much better way to be accurate. And I felt pretty confident that I could set this up outside of the car, move it into the car and actually still be in good shape, probably better shape than as if I had tried to do this all at once in the car. Now that said, once I get this all set up, I'm gonna build a cross member to fit this. I have eyeballed it to make sure that I have more than enough room, but I ordered the wrong hind joints for the front, so I don't even have those. And when I get them, I think it will be easy enough to build a cross member to accommodate this rig. So what the hell are we looking at? It's a piece of plywood with some marks on it. It's pretty simple. The axle is level this way. Then I braced this guy up to three degrees. I also centered the axle on this piece of plywood on which I drew a center line. I did this, follow along, I measured from the backing plate to the center line, from the backing plate to the center line, and made it even. And then, in order to square everything up, I picked a point on the drum, and I measured to where the center point landed here. I measured from the same place on the opposite side to the center point to make sure that my axle was actually square to my center line, not just lined up on it back here and kind of crooked. This is stuff we do in every episode. Then. Working from my center line, knowing I wanted to be about 36 inches wide on my brackets for my radius rod, I went out 18 inches, went out 18 inches, made some marks. From those marks, I snapped a chalk line up to my center mark, roughly four feet away. So now, axles level this way, I have my pinion angle set where I want. My radius rods are set so that the center of these things is going straight to the center of my axle tube, which means they're basically straight out from the axle tube. They're set equidistance apart. And now all I have to do is basically firm up. I'm gonna go off the backing plate to the side of the bracket and on both sides. And then I will be able to use the marks running along the ground here and a carpenter square. I know the chalk line's really faint, but the corner of the carpenter square is lined up on the chalk line by using the chalk line and this carpenter square. I am going to be able to not only make sure that my radius rods are straight up and down, Yes, I have seen the pictures of people that set them up at a weird angle. I don't get it. That doesn't, that doesn't turn it into a weird four bar. I don't understand why you do that. If there's a reason, put it in the comments. But to me, it feels like it'd be helpful when the wheel goes up, but count, like very not helpful when the wheel spins down. So that's, I don't get it. So I'm going to go straight up and down. That's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to line up off my chalk line here. And I'm going to line up off my chalk line there. And uh, that should get us, you know, to a point that's pretty symmetrical off of center. Exactly what the angles are, it's totally calculable, but that's not the point, right? I know where they're headed. I kind of know where they're going. It's based on the length of the car. It's based on some general assessment calls of how I think this is supposed to work and the forces that are at play here, right? We've been over those the whole video. This is just how I'm gonna tackle it on my project. This is about it. I don't know if this is genius or not. Obviously, we are not working with a frame table. We're working on a concrete floor and we're calling that pretty darn close enough for a hot rod. The idea is simple. The doing it takes a ton of measuring. it's really hard to get any solid information on how these things should be set up because, you know, the closer you have these two points, in theory, the better, 
but if they're not super long, you're creating a different problem for the other axis of travel. It's two totally different things that have to coexist. And I think that's the biggest source of confusion for most people, like trying to favor one over the other. So the other reason I think there's not a lot of information on this, and you don't get any instructions or even suggestions or guidelines when you order a kit from Speedway like I did, is because there are many ways to set this up on different vehicles that get different performance results. I'm looking for a smooth driving street car that's gonna keep both wheels going up and over bumps and back down onto the road. I am certain there is a book or a forum or some videos out there on how to do this, maybe even better explained and better executed with better results than what I've done here. But I gotta be honest with you, even though I've done this stuff before, I'm always looking for actual things to stand on, geometry, formulas, uh, you know, the, the understanding the system better. And with this setup, I couldn't find anything out there. So if you know of stuff, please put it down in the comments with like a link or something like that for me and everybody else to watch. But I hope this was helpful for you guys out there. Uh, I hope it makes some kind of sense. It's a lot to wrap your head around and I don't know how good a job I did of explaining it. Welcome back. I hate building cross members. I just, I just hate it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, after a ton of fussing and fighting last night after I got home from work, I got the rear end back under the car and I got the wheelbase set correctly at 103.5 inches. The goal today is to build a cross member that will catch the front of our rear radius rods, thus actually locating our rear end and getting our pinion angle in the right place and all of that stuff so that we can move on being that much closer to a rolling chassis. Now, building the cross member may not be all that bad, but in order to build it, we have to be sure that the rear end is in the right place. And in the right place is subjective to your car. For me, I need the wheelbase to end up being 103 and a half inches, which is what I believe a Model A wheelbase to be. And no matter what you're doing, you need the rear end to be square to the frame, right? Perpendicular. If your rear end is crooked, you're gonna like go down the road like a dog looking for a bone, kind of crooked. We do have adjustment here, but our best bet is to get it right as we set it up, meaning everything is, both hairpins are set up equally with the same amount of threads on every single one of these joints. If we get that lined up and build a cross member to fit that, we will still have some adjustment, but hopefully we'll need very, very little of it. In order to do this right, your car has to be at ride height, meaning the frame relative to the suspension, relative to your front and rear axles, all need to be in the arrangement they're going to be when the car is fully loaded and weight bearing. There is adjustment, but I see a lot of these like build projects where they're building frames and brackets and you know, Basically, they just build a full chassis without any weight or any, anything on it. And, and sure, it'll work, but I think it's gonna be much more optimized if I have real relationships. Meaning, right now, we've got our rear end on jack stands at ride height. It's on jack stands because that makes it a little easier to pivot the pinion as needed. And if I need to shove it forward and backwards, I'm not rocking on wheels. And, uh, we are indeed, it's the frame and the body are sitting on the cross member, which is carrying the weight through the spring onto the rear axle, onto our mounts. Are we fully loaded? Nope. We're missing a couple of people and we're missing a gas tank, but it's better than if it were unloaded. All right, so quick checklist. Both of our hairpin radius rods, all the fittings are the same length, meaning they're overall the same length. Everything's threaded in the same amount. They're bolted securely to the rear end, which has the brackets really well tack welded. We are correct on our wheelbase through a drive shaft kind of in place to see how much, you know, whatever we would need. I had temporary mock-up brackets on the outside of the frame. We're gonna bust those guys off. And then we're gonna start building a cross member that goes in here. I rooted through the old metal pile and this is what we got. A piece of heavy gauge, it's probably 14 gauge, one by two box tubing. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and get started and turn this thing into a cross member that is going to be clear of our drive shaft and also 
hold the front end of our rear radius rods. Like usual, uh, I made some marks after lining this thing up and squaring it up to an existing part of the frame, not the body, because, you know, the world never knows about that. I came off an existing Model A cross member that was in our existing Model A frame, pulled back, made it square to that thing, and I marked against the frame rail here and the frame rail here, and I have some general angle markers and a new center line. This is an old center line when I was going to use this piece for something else. Here's a good time to warn you guys, if you're the types of fellas that want to see this cross member like super shiny and have 250 different kind of like speed holes in it, I encourage you to check out Make It Custom. That Carl Fisher guy is a hell of a fabricator. We differ in style. This thing is going to be pure, purely utilitarian. We're going to make it look decent, we're going to make it strong, and we're going to make it right. We're not going to spend a bunch of time drilling 200 holes that are going to live under the car and just collect water. Like, that is not... Nope. Don't understand that trend. Why do people start doing that? All right, nothing all that elegant yet, but you know, we're working towards it. So all I did was cut it with my marks um, and then I averaged out the distance from center on both of our uh, brackety things and tacked them. Now I only tacked them in one place in case I want to, you know, tap the angle, that kind of thing. But for the most part, you know, there's still a lot of, I, I tightened down the back end on the brackets just to make sure there was as little wiggle movement as possible. But uh, you know, you never know. So Anyway, I guess let's slide this thing back in the car and test fit it, and then we'll move on. All right, gang, you can probably see this better than I can. I've hammered in our newly cut cross member piece. Basically, just put some hardware on here. I'm gonna go ahead and line it up the best I can eyeball as far as like, you know, angling the bracket with the angle of our so I'm just trying to line up the angle of our bracket with the angle of our radius rod. All right, I'm just gonna mark it and then take it out and we'll average, you know, we'll kind of come off center and figure it out. Double it up over on the other side. All right, gang, this is not IndyCar stuff. This is hot rod stuff, but we're gonna get it as right as we can. I don't know exactly what this angle is coming off the rear axle, but I do want it the same on both sides. I also want it the same distance from center. So we're just going to work off that stuff. All I need is a basic, you know, tape measure and a bevel gauge. Uh, when I'm measuring stuff like this, I like to, you know, what I call burn a foot or an inch or whatever makes the most sense. In this case, the foot. And the inside of my mark is at five and one quarter. Flip that around. Burn a foot. I mean, technically, I can just take the bevel gauge at this point. Line it up. It's like a $6 tool. Just grab one next time you're at the hardware store, fellas. Flip it around. Inside of my line. Marker thickness. That's the basic idea. Let's just double check, make sure we're, we're good. All right, so if you take a look for mock-up land, uh, basically, we've started to cinch everything up, you know? Um, I think it's gonna work. I'm gonna keep those mounts symmetrical. I'm gonna hope we're still, you know, good back here. I see nothing that has moved, but I'm saying I hope I measured it correctly last time. I'm gonna go ahead and make that sort of final-ish. All right, dudes, I threw a drive shaft in there and put it way, way up on a jack stand. And, you know, even if I lift this end up, it's uh, it's got more than a half inch of clearance and that's way, way up there. So 
I actually think I'm gonna be okay, I think. So for now, I think it's time to pull this out, clean it up, make it like ready to go. And then uh, decide if I wanna weld it in or if I wanna bolt it in. I think I kinda wanna weld it in because bolting it in stinks, but let's clean it up and figure it out after that. All right, so I decided to weld on these little pieces of plate here because they're gonna slide under the frame. That's gonna help keep this level because as this rotates, the relationship of these points changes like significantly. So I figured this way it could stay flat to the frame. At least it'll be even on both sides. We'll final weld it when it's time to final weld it. Um, but for now, let's go make sure it fits. Here we go, we're knocked into place. It's time to just triple check everything. Just coming off this cross member here. All right, 14 and then three eighths. A little further forward than we had been. 14, three sixteenths. So in theory we can scoot her back just a little bit. All right, so roughly, in place the pinion angle is it like two degrees higher than i want it to be it's about five degrees up but that makes sense because i thought this cross member was going to have to drop down one half inch but that's all right i am happy to fine tune that adjustment by making this one slightly longer and this one slightly shorter and that will rotate everything back down a little bit i think we got more than close enough for this to be adjustable the way that it's kind of meant to be to a dial in our length and dial in our uh, pinion angle. So not bad. I think I'm gonna go ahead and tighten this hardware down, maybe, and then uh, decide if we're gonna weld it in yet or if we just clamp the snot out of it and let it ride for now. I'm actually pretty pleased with the way this is working out right now. Uh, I know this is not the fanciest cross member you will see on the old internet. If that fancy metal fabrication is for you, by all means, make your cross members as fancy, as fancy as you want. I think this is really all you need. It is a pretty heavy gauge, one by two tubing. Remember, we've got forces pushing, we've got forces pulling, and we have rotational forces. So you do want something stout in here. If you feel like drilling a bunch of speed holes with a hole saw to make it look cooler, then get right on it. For now, I'm pretty pleased, so I'm gonna go ahead and tack it in place, and uh, that should be, you know, pretty good to keep going. That will mean that as soon as I can procure some clamps from my rear Model A spring or make some, our back end is a roller. And technically, with those wishbones and those brakes and everything else done, our front end is a roller. I don't quite call it that yet because we don't have any steering components in place, but. We might be able to get there sooner than later too. So, but let's, let's, eyes on the prize. Let's do some tack welding. All right, it's tacked in place. Before I tacked it, uh, I double checked my measurements, made sure it was square, it was clamped. Um, like everything else in the rear suspension and kind of front suspension, it's really well tacked, meaning we should be able to shuffle it around or whatever, but we're gonna have to go back over literally everything. There we go, gang. Really, really simple cross member, just locking in the dimensions and the angles and the measurements and all that stuff of what we did previously. We now have some semi-functioning rear suspension, pending a lot of final welding and fine tuning and that type of thing. But you know what I'm saying. Thanks for watching Between the Sharks. Good luck on your projects out there. This is a big step towards a rolling chassis. In fact, we threw some wheels and tires on it we're pretty much rolling. Now, it'd be nice to have steering set up so that our front wheels don't do all this. So maybe we'll do, you know, dive into that next and come up with a plan because, yeah, if it had some steering, it would be a bona fide roller. That'd be pretty cool. All right, good luck on your projects out there. We'll see you next time on Between the Sharks.